Robert, for those who haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and tell our listeners what we're talking about today. My name is Robert Popovian. I am a pharmacist, uh, PharmD, and I have a master's in pharmaceutical economics and policy. I am currently the founder of the Conquest Advisors. I work as a chief science policy officer at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. I'm a senior health policy fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, and I'm also vice president for health economics and policy at Equidium Health, which is a blockchain technology company. And hopefully today what we should be talking about is what have we learned from this pandemic and how can the professional pharmacy and technology and all these things that we've sort of came across really continue as we come out of the pandemic and to the future and how do we evolve ourselves as not only a profession but as a healthcare industry entity. Robert, I'm glad you call it pandemic. I think that calling it COVID and talking about COVID is no longer hip. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's like we date ourselves, so we have to talk about pandemic. But you know what? Is it every hundred years they're supposed to come? But now that it gets so much attention in the news and they can sell so many ads from it, we're probably going to see a pandemic about every year or two now. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we've had pandemics in the last two decades, right? It's just been a much smaller scale. I remember reading something about the swine flu and how that was going to be big, but then it kind of petered out. Exactly. So we've had occasions where pandemics were happening. It's just not to the scale that what we've seen both on the U.S. and also globally uh, Mm -hmm. with, with what we've seen so far. And really, we never saw the disruption that we saw. And not only disruption to our everyday life, but to the healthcare system and how we need to learn from this and move forward as a country on how we deliver healthcare. If you look out five years, is it a lot healthier healthcare system because of the pandemic we had or is it broken still? I think hopefully we'll learn from it so it will be much healthier. It definitely showed some holes in it, right? That our healthcare system showed some vulnerability. I mean, uh, if you remember the dark days of 2020, where everything was shut down, March, April, May, all the way into June, we realized in the healthcare system we were pretty vulnerable. At the point, at that point, if if you were a patient, and I had relatives who happened to be patient, non-COVID related patients, and you needed to see a healthcare professional, the only entity open that you can go in and see the healthcare professional in person was the pharmacist. Yeah. At the pharmacy. Unfortunately, we can't forget those things and we need to create an environment that we use all of our resources as healthcare professionals to be able to deliver health and not go back to the same old way we used to practice medicine and pharmacy and everything else. From 2015 through 19, I was kind of a recluse here at home. The business was suffering because of all the DIR fees and I didn't really like my employees and Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so... But I kind of felt like, what hole was I filling as community pharmacist? You know, and I started feeling useless, maybe, because I wasn't looking at the patients in their eyes, you know. But then I got in there. I had a big staff change right when COVID hit just by chance. And we weren't even doing vaccinations or anything. But I turned a corner saying, community pharmacists are really needed. Maybe if you have a person who knows their technology well and can get around the internet and things like that but throw in there some of us old farts with some bad eyesight and people maybe who don't know their way around a a smartphone and all kinds of stuff and in a hurry you, you see that community healthcare workers especially pharmacists on the front line were crucial absolutely and this this is what frustrates me mike a lot of times, I mean, I sit back and think about it. I'm willing to say this publicly. I've written about it. I've published about it, how pharmacists were the only healthcare professionals during the dark days of the pandemic that really, if a patient wanted access in the community, they were the only ones available. If not, you had to go to an emergency room or a hospital, but nobody wanted to go because of all the infections that were going on. But why am I, as a former executive of a pharmaceutical company, saying this publicly and not American Pharmacy Association, not the pharmacy associations in the state level? They're still apologizing. They're still trying to fight a fight that really doesn't exist. We need to have 
pharmacists, for example, one of the things that I've been really pushing for for the last 12 months, that pharmacists should have the same ability to immunize patients as physicians do. That means we shouldn't have to rely on PrEP Act and emergency authorizations to do these things. We should have the ability, the same ability and same rights of immunization as physicians do. That means when, if it's FDA approved or there's an emergency use authorization or if it's CDC recommended, pharmacists can do that. That's why we needed the PrEP Act and the emergency authorization to administer the COVID vaccine. Physicians didn't need that. That's not right. That's what we should learn. And this is where I get frustrated sometimes with the pharmacy associations on the state and federal level, that instead of standing up and fighting that issue, they're still fighting the relics of two decades ago of trying to get provider status, which is important. But first, let's make sure that pharmacists are able to practice at the top of the license. And then let's fight for payments and everything else, which I think it will come through because people realize that not only we were the only ones available in the community, people like you serving the patients, but you not only serve them, but you're a very cost-effective model of serving patients at, a, at the level that they need to be served. If you look at the organizations, all right, let's put it in three levels. Well, it could be a million of them, but let's say there's either, and we won't pick on any individual one, let's say the multitude of organizations. Is it, it's probably not, malevolence. They're probably not trying to do the work of the AMA against pharmacy or something. Maybe it's incompetence. Maybe it's having a different idea and then maybe not having the right vision. Where do you think the associations fall into this thing? I think they fall into, they want to do the right thing, but they don't see the future like I see the future or you see the future, Mike, because you've served patients and they don't see it that way. They see it as, well, we have this niche business model that we've created in the community. We should preserve that. And my thing is that model is going away. You know that. I know Mm -hmm. that. That model is being targeted by pharmacy benefit management companies every single day. You need to evolve. It's basically, if not, you perish as an institution. And for me to evolve, it means that you take the opportunity to educate the masses of what happened during this period of time that was very extraordinary and make sure we don't go backwards. Instead, we move forward. I always point to people and say, look, there's a reason why the federal government had to step in and give an emergency authorization for pharmacists to administer a COVID vaccine that should have been authorized from the beginning. We shouldn't have had to wait for that. For it to happen. From day one when those vaccines were available, pharmacists should have been able to administer those vaccines. Unfortunately, state associations don't see eye to eye with me on that. And neither does the American Pharmacy Association to a certain extent. Break it down a little bit more for me. Where do you see the associations going? Where is your thought to go? And do you think there is still a divide? Are you just saying well, now everybody should know the lesson. Or do you think there still is going to be a divide going down a different direction? I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, I deal with a lot of the state associations on the pharmacy side, and their model is to go after the pediatrics, you know, to start immunizing children. My issue is that we don't have a pediatric immunization issue in this country. We have the VFC program for peds. The pediatric vaccination levels have always been very high in the United States. Yes, there's some drop-off because of the pandemic, and we need to have the catch-up doses for these patients to come. But what we have in this country is an under-immunization of adult population. Put COVID aside. Look at the flu vaccination rates and the pneumococcal vaccination rates. We're nowhere close to the 2020, 2021 healthy, uh, healthy levels that we need to be. Uh, so, uh, in other words, adults is where we need to focus our attention on. That's who is going to come to the pharmacies and want to interact with us. Instead, they're chasing their tails with pediatrics and to expand the pediatric vaccination, which is fine, but that should not be the priority. It should be ensuring that pharmacists have the same ability to immunize adult vaccines as physicians do. That means they don't have to wait for a CDC recommendation. As soon as it's approved by the FDA or authorized by the emergency authorization through the FDA, Pharmacists should be able to have the ability to immunize those patients. 
if I'm a pharmacist listening now, I'm saying, Robert, are you living under a rock? Because every pharmacy shouts on their marquees. They say, come in for your flu shot. So what am I missing? Why are all the pharmacists doing this? But you're saying there's a problem. But it's not just flu shots. It's not just about flu. It's about pneumococcal. It's not just about flu and pneumococcal. It's about shingles. It's not just about those three. Gotcha. It's all these other vaccines that adults have access to that pharmacists in certain states. I'm not saying across the country in every state, but certain states prohibit pharmacists from immunizing those vaccines for adults. In addition, in almost every state, except the ex- exception of maybe about the six of them, you still require the CDC to step in and give a recommendation before the pharmacist can actually immunize. That's not the case with physicians. As soon, for physicians, as soon as it's FDA approved, physicians may immunize. Now, they may choose not to, but that's their choice as a professional. They're not being governed by the state. So my intent is to pass state laws in every state that says as soon as the drug is approved by the FDA or early emergency utilization is provided or it's CDC granted uh, for recommendation, pharmacists should be able to immunize. We don't have to wait anymore, just like we had to wait for a couple of months, right, before the emergency authorization came through for, from HHS for us to be able to do the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine. People forget that. So that's my goal in life is basically to allow pharmacists to have the same authority as a physician do. Uh, does in immunizing are there any states that say zero vaccines we don't care if the doctor said it's okay so in all states they're doing maybe some flu shots by the doctors yeah almost every state allows flu and pneumococcal that's the thing that we fall into the trap because what we see is that well it's flu and pneumococcal well that's not the only vaccines adults get there's travel vaccines there's all these new vaccines that are being developed there's a shingles vaccine And at some point, we have to realize, so the other thing that we run into, the trap that you hear from people is to say, well, we can't administer anything until CDC recommends it. Well, CDC recommendation, putting COVID aside, may take months, if not years, before something gets recommended, especially for the adult space. And I can give you multiple examples of that. So are we willing to say that we're going to wait for months and years after a product has been approved by the FDA? for the patients to have access to that product through the pharmacies, while in the same time, physicians, you know, most often don't carry those vaccines, especially for adults, because they don't know how to control inventory, and it's not lucrative enough for them to continue to carry things that you're going to have one or two patients walking in once every two months or something to get the vaccine done. So, in other words, we're creating an access barrier for patients. And the best way to get rid of that access barrier is for the pharmacist to have the same authority as physicians in immunizing adult patients, period. Devil's advocate again. Here we go. Robert, you want everybody to get the vaccines, but if I come in and I want Lipitor or something, you know, nobody can just come into my pharmacy and get it. They need a doctor's prescription. And guess what? The DEA is never going to say it's okay just for the pharmacy to hand out Lipitor. So why the big push for the vaccines when every other drug doesn't really have any of this clearance? Uh, Well, no, because we have over-the-counter drugs that treat disease areas, correct? I knew you'd have an answer. Correct. Yes. So that's that's one thing. But I don't disagree on the Lipitor example. For you to be diagnosed with hypercholesteremia requires a diagnosis. The vaccine doesn't require a diagnosis. Gotcha. You don't need a di- become diagnosis. You qualify for it based on an FDA label or a CDC recommendation. Gotcha. You know? It's not like... So the only hang-up, to be honest with you, which is the true excuse of why this would not should not happen, is because... You also don't want duplication, right? Mm. You don't want to get the vaccine in the physician's office and then go to a pharmacy and get the vaccine in the pharmacist's office, right? But that can be resolved because we have state registries, which everybody participates in, that they can register the patient when they administer the vaccine. So those things are excuses to me. The real challenge we have in this country is that Giving a vaccine to a patient is not a diagnosis, similar to what you just talked about with Lipitor. That makes a lot of sense. Why aren't the associations saying maybe it's too big of a leap and the AMA is going to be against it and let's baby step this in here? Is there any 
argument that it's done through baby steps and it's not going to happen with this big leap? Well, baby steps is going to also going to have you perish as a profession. So Yeah, we don't have time for baby steps, yeah, right? Yeah, we don't have time. As a profession, we don't have the time, especially on the community level. We're because people are pushing into mail order and replacement technology and all these things, right? So that's one. Yeah. The second part that excuse that I hear is that well, if we don't get CDC recommendation, for example, it, uh, we're not going to get coverage for it. Mm-hmm. You know, th- through third party, through insurance or Medicaid or Medicare. And my thing is, first of all, vaccines are not super expensive. They're not like the you're not talking about a cancer drug that's hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, we, from we know from COVID, you know what the cost of COVID vaccine was. Each shot was about twenty bucks. There's a lot of patients out there who will be willing to pay out of pocket, you know, for cash. Why are you suppressing their access? They're willing to do it. Yeah, they're willing to do it. There's a lot of things we've learned from the generic market. You and I have had this conversation in our last podcast, and we have evidence now. There's a lot of patients who are switching to cash generics. Mm-hmm. People never thought this would happen. Right that they would go pay cash out of pocket for generic medicines instead of using their insurance card. If we create a cash market for vaccines, especially for vaccines that are not super expensive, which we know there are, yeah, let's say 80% is not going to do it. But then you're you're basically saying that 20% should not be allowed to pay out of pocket and get the access to that vaccine. I'll give you one perfect example. So uh, when the... uh, When the... Meningitis B vaccine came out. There were very few people who were administering the vaccine. First of all, pharmacists couldn't administer the vaccine because it was not recommended by the CDC. So they couldn't do it. And in the places that they could, in states that they could, they, there was no insurance coverage for most of the time. But I had a lot of parents calling me because they knew I worked for Pfizer at that point who were saying, Look, I'm willing to pay for this damn thing out of pocket before my kid goes to the dormitory because I'm scared to death with having them come down with meningitis. So, in other words, you're suppressing their needs because maybe 80% of the population may not pay for it. What about the 20%? We know from the generic market that if you create a competitive cash marketplace, people, patients will switch and not use their insurance and pay for it in cash. We know that. We have the evidence now. Get the whole damn vaccination thing out of insurance. Just say, look, it's going to cost whatever. It's going to cost $100 a year to get vaccinated. And we know this is true. Let's reduce insurance premiums by like $500, which would be the inflated price of all this baloney. And let's reduce that by 500 and let's have a hundred dollar a year cash payment. People would have $400 in their pocket, but they might not like it because they don't think insurance is doing it. Or in the meantime, they're getting screwed. Exactly. You're right. And it's not just vaccines and it's not just generics. I'll give you another example. So JAMA published an article about medical services provided in hospitals. Uh, So in the study, they looked at what happens if a patient is willing to pay cash versus using the insurance. What they found in like 70 procedures that they looked, that in every case, the 70 cases of procedures, the hospital was willing to take less money in cash from the patient than they were actually being reimbursed through insurance. So that tells me there's a cash market available. What if we just get patients to pay for it out of pocket? We will get better return on investment because what you're doing is getting rid of a lot of the middlemen in there and you know about middlemen oh, yes. and how they inflate prices so there's multiple examples it's not just vaccines it's generics it's, it's procedures in hospitals i mean there's evidence now we know that the market works if you let it work and if you have a competitive marketplace where people are transparent about their prices my brother he had shingles I don't know, a few years ago, and now about like 10 seconds out of every minute, he gets a zap on his back from this, uh, where the nerves were damaged or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think about a couple of things. One is that COVID has put a kibosh basically on things like shingle shots for the last two years. I think about all the poor people that are going to get shingles now. And then I Mm -hmm. think about... Hearing what I hear from my brother about that pain on his back that may never go away, that's worth like $10,000 for me not to go what he's going through, you know? And it's like, maybe I wouldn't buy that, but 
let me have the choice and then let me have the choice of a pharmacist doing it for me. Exactly. Instead of having to get an appointment and go to the physician and getting it done in the physician's office, why can't the pharmacist administer these things? And you know, shingles is not a problem. Pneumococcal is not a problem. Flu is not a problem. But there are other vaccines we're talking about, the travel vaccines, right? When patients have to travel, uh, now we don't do traveling. So that's another excuse. Well, who's traveling? Well, yeah, we're going to go back into international traveling. Why do you have to go to a physician to get all your travel vaccines or get authorization or prescription from a physician to get the travel vaccines done? Those are all requirements. It's, it's black and white. There's no diagnosis, right? If you're traveling to a certain country, you have to get certain vaccines. So why can't the pharmacist administer these vaccines automatically when they become available in the market, when they get approval from the FDA? The dengue vaccine that was approved several years ago, it sat at least, I haven't checked recently, it sat about 12 months before C- that CDC hadn't mo- made a move on it. I mean, CDC wasn't made. So any state that requires only pharmacists administering CDC required vaccine couldn't administer this vaccine to the patient. Time is of the essence with allowing pharmacists to do this. Tell me again why you think the associations are not pressing this. I... I really think that they get they get into an area that they believe, well, it's enough to have flu and pneumococcal and they don't realize what the future of vaccines looks like because they don't they're not privy on what the what is being thinking about being developed, right? So I wrote an article actually in the, on the hill last year about the future of a lot of diseases is going to boil down to vaccines, hmm. cancers, uh, you know, HIV and things like that, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So we better get used to it, that vaccines are going to be part of not only these pandemics and infectious diseases, but chronic disease management, perhaps, or treatment or, or treatment of chronic diseases. So they're not thinking long term. They're thinking here and now. And they don't realize I'm thinking for three, four years down the line. And the reason I'm thinking that way is that as these products come into the market, every time a new product comes in, in certain states, you literally have to go introduce legislation to allow pharmacists to administer these things. We're not going to have a federal authorization like we did with the COVID. So imagine the waste of time, the resources and the efforts. And nobody has explained to me coherently of why shouldn't pharmacists have this ability other than, you know, those things that they get fooled by flu and uh, pneumococcal and shingles. And the insurance issue, which to me is a non-starter because we have case examples of paper. people are willing to pay out of pocket for certain things now. Do you see any association? Think of yourself as a, a marketer. Do you see any problem in them doing this in terms of it's hurting some other goal or maybe it'll water down some other area they're doing? Is there a negative? Like if an association said right now, it's like, oh, Let's do this. What's on the negative side for them pushing this? It could be. I mean, I don't know what their priorities are. And But you're right, because it's a trade-off, right? Because there's a sort of certain amount of bandwidth that, state, especially state associations with state legislative efforts, have to go through. Because, you know, as much as we talk on the federal level, it's really the state level, because that's who governs the practice of pharmacy. It's not the federal government. I mean, put COVID aside, again... It's the states that have to make that decision, and they do have other priorities that they're tackling with. But my thing is, for me, that's an important issue, and it's been an important issue for me for about three or four years now. It's nothing new that I've been yelling and screaming about. It's just that the COVID issue just and the pandemic, sorry. You know, I don't want to <laughs> we, keep saying COVID. <laughs> we said we shouldn't use COVID. We said that, yeah, we're not going to use COVID. People are sick of this, so we're going to now go under just pandemic. We were. We did but this pandemic, it pushed some ideas forward that probably were lying back. And the biggest idea was that, look, when the chips were down and patients needed a healthcare professional in the community, pharmacists were the only ones. Yeah. Period. And that should be the slogan on every single association's starting point when they talk to the people, is that we were it. We were it in the community. You couldn't go see a physician. If you wanted to see a primary care physician, you had to do a Zoom call. The only re- way you could go see a pediatrician was to do a Zoom call. We were the only entity that stayed open and people could go walk into a pharmacy 
and talk to a pharmacist, period. Is the relative silence of the associations, is this a huge windfall for somebody or is it like, no, we're all going to rise up together in the tide. Everybody should be talking about it. Everybody should be talking. And the reason being is that, and the same thing happens in the medical community. When issues come up with regards to practice of medicine or practice of pharmacy, the legislative folks, the legislators, the policymakers want to hear from the associations. They want to hear from the regular pharmacists and physicians. They don't want to hear from business people and everything else because at the end of the day, they are the ones that are going to influence the behavior. They want to hear why and why not. So the association is really the focal point, needs to be the focal point. Maybe academia, but academia is also sort of tinged and busy with doing other things. It's really the associations and pharmacists like you who actually practice every day. I read this like half a year ago, and they were saying how the social media slash smartphone slash internet has taken over a lot of the spots where we used to need church. The funeral get together now is taken over by some memorial on Facebook where people are doing this, you know, and the giving as a community is taken over by GoFundMe and the group helping out is taken over by a sign me up program or something like that. So a lot of the needs of the local church are now online. Do you see social or the new media as another leg of what associations have done? And just like, let's say how churches, maybe how some of that attendance maybe has gone down for various reasons, but let's say some of it might be social. Has social media risen where some of the associations have gone down? Can social do this somehow in place of maybe the associations that aren't doing it, or at least not as strongly as you'd like to see? Social can do it, but again, you need to have somebody who actually goes and lobbies, right? Because these require lobbyists and these require interventions in the state level from a policy perspective. So, yeah, social media can be a component of educating and pushing the messaging out there. But at the end of the day, you need foot soldiers to be able to walk in and change laws. And you need legislators on your side to be able to change these laws and regulations. What would be a really effective day for a lobbyist? What are they doing? Are they like helping write these things? Are they taking these guys out for lunch and slipping them some hundreds? Let's say a lobbyist was trying to push this. What would be a good day for them? A good day would them to get the attention of a legislator and really educate them on why is this important and support it with data. On the golf course, at lunch? Not anymore. I mean, last two years, nobody's seeing anything face to face, right? Because of that pandemic. Let's say after the pandemic, what's a good connection? Even after the pandemic, I think with the lobbying laws and regulations, both on the federal and the state level, it's really hard to think about how lobbyists are functioning versus 20, 30 years ago. Uh, I think there's a lot of disclosure issues and everything else. I think what lobbyists, good day for a lobbyist would be is able to educate the individual of why this is important. So you just mentioned like all the priorities the state associations have. Policymakers have also priorities, right? They are not just dealing with healthcare. They're dealing with education and financing and taxes and uh, energy and everything else in their state. So they need to prioritize that too. So a good day for lobbyists would be to move this issue on top of the priority of a policymaker to make it compelling enough for them to take time because they're going to have to then trade off. It's a trade off with other things. Is that like a 20 minute meeting with one of the aides of the Congress person or what does that actually look like? It depends. I mean, it depends on the congressional member, depends on the, uh, who the policymaker is that you're talking to. It may be talking to their aide because they do a lot of the work and usually uh, aides have specialties. That means there are certain aides uh, that work with congressional members or in the, even the, the state level that specialize on healthcare or taxes or energy or something, education, something else. So that's one thing. But then there are individual policymakers who have a personal interest in it. We have a lot of healthcare professionals that are both on the state level and on the federal level that are, you know, congressional members or state legislators. 
who may have a personal interest on the topic who will get engaged. Some of my favorite movies are like time travel and things like that. If you wake up tomorrow, Robert, and you find out you're one of the senators for Virginia, does that put a smile on your face when you wake up in the morning or are you going back to bed? No, I'm going back to bed. Are you? <laughs> yeah. Why? You wouldn't like that? No. I, Why not? I, because I... You could have access to the head honchos for this. Well, not really, because my outlook in life is that I'm very curious. Hmm. I have three things that I look... I'm a very curious person to start with. I'm very helpful, but I'm also relentless. And sometimes those things don't work in policy and politics because things don't happen as quickly as you would want it to. Plus, curiosity sometimes is not viewed very well in our world because curiosity means that you want change and change doesn't fit well uh, with the po political environment. So, no, I wouldn't want to be a, po a policymaker. People used to say, like, not to me necessarily, but to other people, you know, you've got very strong views. You should be a good politician. It's like, eh. no, I mean, a good politician, right? You got to give and take. And Absolutely. You generally don't have very strong views. Maybe you do in certain issues, but not on all issues because it is a give and take. And, and you also have to play the game, which, and you can't be curious because it's hard to change policy in this country. That's what I'm saying. This is a seminal moment for our profession as pharmacists to step up and make the compelling case of why this should happen. As we watch TV, you know, we think that judges are, are very creative, you know, and we think that doctors are creative and politicians are creative. It's like, I've been in court sometimes, you know, and when the judge makes a ruling, you know, they just don't lick their finger and put it up in the air and, and make a decision. I mean, they're like quoting all the laws that they're basing this on and stuff. And I think of like comedians and rock stars and stuff. It's like you think they're artists and they're creative and stuff. And it's like they sing the same damn song, you know, thousands of concerts and shows in a row. And all of that's kind of the opposite of like raising questions and being curious. It's like they pretend like they're artists, but it's kind of like Put your nose to the grindstone and do this. Right, exactly. And it's, it's, it, people have assumptions that is not true. Uh, I think uh, a lot of times we assume people just make things up and they don't. Uh, they are following certain rules and guidelines and suggestions and everything else. And at times, those suggestions are outdated and just need to be called out, in my opinion. If you woke up as any politician, would you want to go back to bed? Is there Anything that you would take? Yeah, sure. I would take it, but it has to be something that I can make a difference. Which one? I I would say probably health and human services because that's where it touches health care. Would you have to be a congressperson to be on that? No, you, no, it's an appointee. It's an appointee position, uh, part of CMS or CMMI because that's when you really touch health care, right? That, that's my interest. I mean, uh, yes, I have expertise in economics and policy and talk a little bit about blockchain and things like that, but everything sort of funnels to healthcare. And I use those expertise to move healthcare along and make it healthcare better for patients, which is at the end of the day, my patients are the only entity in the system, besides, I would say patients and employers, you're an employer, you know this, are the only entities in the system that pay for healthcare. You know, people mistakenly say it's pharmacy benefit management companies or insurers. That's absolutely wrong. And it's not even government because government pays for healthcare through taxes. Guess who pays for taxes? You and I do. So when you bare bone it, the only people who open their wallets are the patients and pay for healthcare in this country and employers who subsidize a lot of the healthcare for their employees that pay for this health, for the healthcare. The rest of the people are just consumers and middlemen and basically or they funnel money from one center to another so for me it would be any agency that impacts patients lives and employer lives perhaps because they're the ones that really are in the middle of paying for the healthcare system in the u.s market i always get a kick out of it when people tell me well we don't have a free healthcare system i said nobody has a free healthcare system Canada doesn't have a free healthcare system. They just collect a bunch of taxes and pay for healthcare, but the taxes are not coming from the thin air. They're coming from individuals who work and pay taxes. 
So nobody has a single, no single payer system or no, there's no such thing as a free healthcare system. It's just a matter of how do you subsidize it? Is it through taxes or is it through employees or through patients who open their wallets every day to pay for it? There's so many levels. And unfortunately, there's some of those levels that try to obfuscate things on purpose. Do you remember the old telephone game, Robert? Do you ever play that where you sat around and someone would say something on this end and then it would go through all the ears and then by the time it came out from like the sixth person, the message would be all jumbled? You played that, right? Absolutely. Operator or Absolutely. telephone or something Always. like that? Always. Telephone. We used to call telephone. it telephone. But think about yeah. playing that when somebody in the middle i.e. the PBMs, are like saying something wrong on purpose and then just to make it fun, they throw a foreign language on top of it. Well, that and plus, it's not just the PBMs. I mean, the whole farm... And I know more about the pharmacy supply chain than anything else. Yeah. I mean, the healthcare supply chain is much less opaque and there's only there's fewer in between, like sort of like people who have their hands in the cookie jar. The health care supply is not as opaque it's it's not as opaque and there's fewer in between people like what we have in the pharmacy business as in caring for someone who's sick in the hospital or yeah something. like physicians or hospital services versus pharmacy has so many go-betweens it's like between the pharmaceutical industry and the patient you know you have all these entities within the supply chain that make money off of the supply chain you know, and uh, I can name you at least half a dozen right off the top of my head. I mean, you're talking about pharmacy benefit management companies and insurers number one and two probably, yeah. right? Then you have hospitals, which make money. You have academicians and, uh, you know, you have wholesalers and you have consultants and, uh, you know, benefit consultants and things like that, that their reimbursement is tied to like how much rebate contracting is done and everything else. So it's all these people that make money off of the supply chain that are sort of in go-between that provide very little, if any, value to it, you know? I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was just on a, on another podcast, and they asked me, they said, what do you think of pharmacy benefit management companies? I said, well, I know what pharmacists do, what value they bring to the system. I know what physicians value they bring to the system, nurses, optom optometrists, dentists, hospitals. Tell me, what is the benefit that the pharmacy benefit management companies, what is the value? Is it saving money? Well, clearly we've shown that they're probably making more money off of it than saving money to the system. Yeah. So they're the, the enigma, basically, that we're like sort of like we can't get rid of. What's that word you mentioned, academician? Academician is individuals like professors and everything else that work in. They're part of that buffer? Sure. How? Sure. Because as pharma companies go into more rare diseases, uh, development of rare disease drugs and everything else, you're not talking about you know, there's individuals in this country that specialize in that. So when they have the patient population that with these rare diseases that you need for doing your clinical trials, guess what they're going to do? They're going to say, well, the clinical trial is no longer going to be $1,000 per head. It's going to be $10,000 per head because I control these patients. They also make money uh, off of the supply chain. In my mind, I'm always thinking that the heads, the scientists and things doing these are more employed by the manufacturing company? No, this is not true. Actually, the way that research were in manufacturing, they have medical directors, they have PhDs and everything else that do the, they do some of the research and basic research and development, but clinical trial, when it comes down to doing trials. clinical trials, pharma companies don't do clinical trials. They, they contract out that service to help, like people like Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, individual physicians who, and pharmacists that do those research, PhDs that do that research. Pharma companies are not enrolling patients in clinical trials. Interesting. They have a hand in development of the protocol and everything else and, and the way that protocol is set up. But then they hand that out to contract research organizations and those contract research organizations, then they contract out with different academicians, different clinicians, different pharmacists, physicians, things like that to do the actual research. You and I have talked before about you being in the blockchain industry and so on. And that comes into play here somehow, right? Keeping track of all these patients and all this research that's going on, especially the clinical research. Yeah. So it's a great point. So I work with Equitium Health, 
which is a blockchain technology AI uh, federated learning group. And one of the areas that it's working on is decentralized clinical trials. Why is decentralized clinical trials important is because imagine me as a patient sitting in North Dakota and I have a rare disease, but there's only like three sites that are doing the research. And one of the site, the closest site to me is in Austin, Texas. I'm not going to get on a plane and go to Austin, Texas and enroll myself, but I need that help. I need it as a patient. I, I qualify for this trial. So we need to have decentralized clinical trial where the patient can be somewhere different while they can enroll in a clinical trial being done somewhere else. But why is blockchain come into this place? Because blockchain is inherently is needed for security of data. Because the worst thing you can do if you don't have centralized clinical trial where you have the patient coming in, being monitored at the site and everything else in the data collected, is that if they're sitting in another state or decentralized from the clinical setting, you're going to have to make certain that the data that's been collected is clean and is usable, right, at the end of the day. And that's where blockchain comes in because inherently what blockchain does is secure data, you know, and make sure that it's not manipulated. Can you imagine now, I'm again, I'm sitting in North Dakota and the clinical trial was being done in Austin and I'm part of a decentralized clinical trial. I need to go, for example, give lab tests. I have to provide some, like my... Uh, uh, vitals have to be taken and everything else. You want to have a certainty that that data is not going to be manipulated or changed or any mistakes are made. So that's where blockchain comes into play, is security of data to be able to be transported. Are people ever disrupting that data on purpose? And does blockchain help that? No. It's just it's just accidental. Yeah, it's accidental. I mean, it happens, right? A, a decimal point may be, get moved and, you know, you may not know why it was moved. But as blockchain, you secure the data to make sure that it's not being manipulated unnecessarily. Because you need certainty of data, right? At the end of the day, the most important thing is that as a pharmaceutical industry, as a clinician who's doing clinical trials, you want to make sure that the data is correct. Because you're going to be applied for, uh, you know, approval or get the patients to use it. You want to have certainty in the data. I've heard of blockchain, obviously, for money, and then I've heard of it even for, like, people that have solar panels on their house. You know, they can now sell, like, bits of energy to their neighbor even and stuff, and you can follow it through all this. For your example, financials have been using block technology, blockchain technology for a long time. It's been very well established. Why? Because you need certainty of this money moving around. You don't want it to be manipulated. Same thing with energy. You want to have certainty that the energy units are being appropriately uh, utilized and moved around. And same thing with data when it comes to clinical trials. But it's not just for clinical trials that blockchain is being used now or is being thought about being used, especially for decentralized clinical trials, because you don't have the patient physically there anymore, right, as a site. But it's also being used for uh, research and development between pharma companies because as they collaborate, they want to have the data being pristine among the different entities that are collaborating to do the research. Like if blockchain didn't exist, if I was in charge of it, I'm like, all right, everybody, at least use the same damn database. You know, let's all use the same columns or something. And I, and I know people don't even do that. So I can just see the value of blockchain. Yeah. We mentioned finance and energy and, and health. What are some other yeah. cool areas of blockchain right now? Well, pharmacy actually in pharmaceuticals is being used for track and trace, for uh, inventory utilization. Because remember, you need to track these drugs going in. So blockchain technology is being used for track. That's the actual part that currently is being used for reconciliation and things like that when you have products being returned to making sure that the product has uh, not been uh, corrupted and manipulated. So Technology is actually currently being used by the pharmaceutical industry. And you know this, you own a pharmacy, you know, when you have to send inventory back because they've expired and everything else, you need to sort of keep track of these things uh, now these days. So that's where the technology is really being used. But the future, the near future is in clinical trials and research and development. And long term is in this new payment models that we're talking about, whether it's, you know, value-based contracting, optimization contracting, when you start exchanging money and data to be able to do, you need certainty on those information. And that's where blockchain comes in. I had a guest on and they were saying, look, we're never going to get rid of PBMs. You're always going to need some bigger organization that's going to 
be the one that funnels the money back and forth and all this. You want it transparent, but you're always going to need this. But here's a question. I hear a lot of whenever I'm on my uh, dark web conspiracy theory websites, I always <laughs> I always hear about I always hear about people talking about well, you hear it all the time. I'm joking, but they want the bitcoins and the blockchains to get the banks out of the middle of it. You know, you don't want the US bank in the middle. You just want to verify data in a non-centralized banking thing. Is that ever a way to get rid of the PBMs? I mean, could this be so good that you would have like easier payments and then not have this payment behemoth in the middle? So I've given up on getting rid of PBMs. I don't think they're going anywhere, but what we need is transparency in the market for them. Two things. Number one, transparent. Be 100% transparent. Show us where the flow of money is, you know? And that comes in. One of the things that I've advocated the last few months is that audit rights. Employers and the federal government and the state government should have audit rights of the PBM mm-hmm. books. They don't have that. Uh, if you look at a lot of the policy decisions that federal government is proposing with changes in drug pricing, ne- drug price negotiation and everything else, a lot of the reports they're using to justify these policy positions are based on not only outdated data, they're using like 2016 data to make decisions on 22 and beyond policies, which is like you basing your household budget based on what you were making in 1985. Yeah, probably more back then. <laughs> <laughs> right, I know, exactly. Your net probably yeah. was higher, uh, you know. But my point is that you can't do that. So federal government is the biggest, uh, like, uh, that they don't have access to the audit rights is mind-boggling to me because they're the largest, basically, they paid for the most yeah. for the uh, pharmaceuticals in this country. So they don't have audit rights. They're using outdated data. But then when you start looking into these reports, that whether they come from the congressional staff or they come from the CBO, you quickly realize that all their assumptions is based on some PBM executive said, oh, we passed back 95% of the rebates back. And there's no way you can audit them because you don't have audit rights. So in other words, I've given up getting rid of PBMs. If we're going to continue doing the corrupt rebate contracting, which to me is extremely corrupt and it creates misaligned incentives in the market, at least the federal government and employers should have audit rights of the books. And we should have complete transparency of where the flow of money goes. Is that unprecedented to them not having audit rights there? Are there other industries that you could say, well, yeah, but look at the, you know, the XYZ industry. You can't see those. Or is this like an oddity that PBMs are keeping the government out? I'm not sure if it's an oddity, but it is the one area that it impacts everyday patients, right? Because of lack of this audit rights and transparency when you force the patients, when they have a coinsurance or deductible, to pay based on an inflated retail price, you know, when they have those two entities in their insurance market, then patients should have a right to know. They should know what's going on. And, you know, I'm sure it's not unprecedented that the government doesn't have audit rights in other parts of the economy or purchasing uh, that they purchase. But this impacts patients directly because a patient who walks in, to a pharmacy and has a coinsurance or deductible today is paying based on an inflated retail price, and that's not right. Here's the shameful thing I think about PBMs and the opaqueness is that I'm a patient. I walk into a pharmacy and somehow I get screwed. You know, I have to pay more money and there's a clawback mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. the thing is where I'm getting screwed. I don't really know I'm getting screwed. My employer has enough going on, you know, 500 employee business in town. They don't really care if I'm getting screwed because they don't know. I'm not going to probably quit to find a different insurance somewhere else because I know when the new year comes around, they might even switch insurances anyways if I try to find an insurance where some employer covers that insurance. So it's like this never even gets back to the purchaser of the insurance for most people. And then if it did, then you got the brokers coming and saying, well, okay, we'll give you a discount. Well, they weren't told that the discounts off of a obscure ADB, you know, it's just, there's so many levels and it's sad because it's the patient that's getting hurt, but no one knows. No one knows. And 
it's really I don't blame the employers because they are not aware of it. They're not aware of it. No, when I talk to employers and I finally actually last year wrote a paper that said 12 steps employers can take to protect their employee benefits from pharmaceuticals. And Northeast Business Group on Health asked me to come and talk about the paper because they found it compelling enough. And there's like simple 12 steps that you can take as an employer to really protect yourself, but it requires work. Yeah. And what PBMs are banking on is apathy. Yes. You know, as an employer, your job is to create a business model that makes money off of based on what you're trying to sell or, you know, yeah. create. Not to develop healthcare benefits, right? Healthcare exactly. benefits is something that you provide because you want to, because you want to have a healthy work workforce and everything else. So they bank the PBMs and the insurers bank on apathy. They yep. bank on uh, not you not having the time to do so, and then they basically bank on brokers to do their selling for them. That's why I always re- recommend, like with. Um, employers, smaller employers hire a consultant because there are these consultants out there that actually will tell you that they guarantee savings when they go through your benefits. As an employer, I asked my insurance person last year, I said, because there are always increases, right? So I said, and they give you like four or five plans to compare. I said, can you run my last year's claims through this year pretend like we're repeating this year but with the new structure the new price thing and can you tell me how i came out or like no we don't have that function you know i said all right well let's say that i'm gonna have the same this year as you know i i tried to word it some way they're like no we don't have that function it's like baloney so then i have to you know go to my son and say hey can you i can't figure this out give me some scenarios he's like well if if so and so does this and gets this medicine and so on we'll get this and it's like took him to give it to me and then I barely understood it, you know, even though I'm supposed to understand stuff like that. And it's crazy. It's all on purpose too. Yeah, it's on purpose. They make it difficult. They make it very complicated. The more difficult and complicated you make the system, people are just going to throw up their hands and walk away, right? And say, you know what? Fine. You're going to increase my prices by 10%. Like my premiums are only going up by 5%. I'm happy. The reality is your premium should have probably gone down by 5%. Yeah. But they're banking on your apathy. I'll give you one perfect example. So, uh, PBMs will always tell you they have these national formularies, right, that they sell employers all the time. And But in the clause it says, well, as an employer, you have the right to pick and choose. You can change the formula. It's up to you. You know, we're just – this is a recommendation from us. The reality is that 99.9% of employers will never change that because as soon as you start messing around with it, first of all, you have to take the time to mess around with it. But secondly, the BMM says, oh, yeah, by the way, your premiums, in case you're making any changes, is going to go up by 20%. So what are you going to do? You're just going to say, forget it. I'm just going to walk away and take whatever's on the shelf. My dad used to complain to me before we built our house. He complained to me. He said, Mike, I hated dealing with the builders because when you told them that you wanted to take one of the windows out, they'd say, okay, uh, that'll save you 200 bucks. And then you say, okay, well, I want to put the window though. The one I took out and saved 200 on, I want to put that over there down the wall. They're like, that's going to cost you a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. Wait a minute. Why isn't it 200 yeah. bucks? Yeah, exactly. So, that's why people have a tendency, PBMs come out and t- use words like that, like people have choice and people can make, like the best example I hear from PBMs is that, well, physicians have access to any prescription that they want to write as long as they have to go through a prior authorization system, right? But they make the prior authorization system so complicated that a physician is like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to spend five hours going through this. And they just give up. A previous guest of mine was saying how some of the smarter minds he knows work for PBMs. And I'm like, how do you know they're smart, though? I said, what do you mean you think they're smart? And he said, well, when we both know the same information, we both had the same input, they seem to do a real good job of capturing that and kind of spitting it back and seeing the big picture, understanding it all. These people come into a PBM, they use those skills to find the best ways to connive to make it as opaque as they can. (laughs) What an ironic situation. 
Yeah, but we let them do it, right? I mean, we're basically allowing them to do it. I'll, I'll give you an example of the federal government. Federal government through the Sunshine Law, and you and I are healthcare professionals. If a if a if a pharma company buys us a cup of coffee, they have to report mm. that, right? A five dollar cup of coffee. They're okay with that, and they are okay with collecting all that information and putting the burden, but they don't want any transparency on how much rebates are being collected, or how much fees and <laughs> concessions are being given, and how much is flows back. So it's we're letting them get away with this, uh, and it's it's gotten worse because what they've through this vertical integration, yeah. more opacity has been like, produced into the market. They can hide money. I mean, I always get a laugh out of research that comes out and says majority of rebates go to uh, that are collected. Actually, pharmacies are the ones that benefit from it. But you have to step back. Almost a hundred percent of rebate contracting, almost hundred percent. There's some exceptions are coming through specialty drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever is considered a specialty drug. Yeah. Who dispenses specialty drugs in this United States? 80% of the market is the PBMs and the insured, the integrated market. Right? So, yeah, technically it goes to the PBM pharmacy and it's controlled by the pharmacy dollars, right? Yeah. But the reality is it's the PBM, really. So, it's all matter of optics. Yeah. You know, it's uh, we, we've allowed this to happen as uh, policymakers have been asleep at the wheel and they're not willing to do anything about it. That's the problem. We know that PBMs and the insurance companies want this stuff opaque. Are there other players that want it opaque? Do some of the politicians want it opaque because they're staying elected because of all the backhanded stuff in Washington? Are the politicians benefiting from this being opaque still because of the big money and the elections and things like that? It's not just confusion, right? Because even something confusing, it seems like if people really wanted to understand it, they could. I got to think there's there's a ton of money in this that has spread out from the PBMs and the insurers to other people who say, let's keep it opaque. Well, let's be honest. Campaigns cost money and politicians are no different than anybody else that they need the money to run these campaigns. But overall, I think that's not the major influencer. The major influencer is because it's a complicated system intentionally made to be complicated because the way I look at it is that even individuals who are not influenced by politics or campaigns and things like that, like CBO or HHS, that these are appointees, these are staffers that are government employers, employees, why aren't they calling out these things? You know, so that's what tells me there's more about apathy, more about they bought into the arguments rather than the money in the politics issue that it sort of evolves. In my opinion, if, if, if it was true, it would be all the policymakers that would be opposed to it. But the reality is staffers within CBO who should know better are as complacent and as compliant with this whole market moving the way it is. What's a cool way that you look to the next week and say, ah, I feel kind of good about that? So it's finishing a research project, uh, getting a publication done, uh, thinking about a new research project, that can move the move it forward. Hearing news like FTC is going to actually ask for public comments about investigating insurers or PBMs, news like that uh, brings me out. Which is a no go, right? Well, not necessarily. So yes, there was a vote on the FTC level with regards to doing a formal investigation. Oh, I got you. But FTC now, after that vote didn't happen because it was a 2-2 tie. So two Republicans voted against it, two Democrats voted for it, and it didn't go anywhere. FTC now has announced that they're looking for public comments about looking into the issue of PBM. Gotcha. So it's a little bit different than a formal investigation. So they're looking for public comments. So people are going to have the ability, public is going to have the ability to comment about the PBM contracting models and things like that. So those are the type of things that I get excited about. And then the other thing is that as I see the profession and the pharmacy profession moving forward, as they do things to really make the changes that we necessarily need. Because look, in this business, uh, since I was in pharmacy school, everybody told me that mail order was going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not true. You see all these ads about mail order pharmacies and everything else. One thing you notice in these ads, there are no old people Mm -hmm. in it. It's all the young people getting their whatever they're getting through mail order, you know, their prescription drugs. 
I'm fine with that. That's not the population that pharmacists really need to intervene with that are looking for help from pharmacists. It's the chronic disease patients who are elderly, who are using multiple therapies. And to this day, I can show you data that shows when patients get sick, they don't want mail order. They actually want to walk into a pharmacy and see a pharmacist. And we need to take that to heart and start putting our big boy pants on yeah. as, an, as a profession and start advocating for being able to become truly practiced on top of our license, you know, because that will help patients, that will help other healthcare professionals because they don't have to do that work. And it will help most, mostly our society because we know we have better access to pharmacies than any other healthcare professional in this country. It was proven even more during the pandemic. Now we just need to take that information and be not be able to be scared about talking about it and promoting it. And that's another thing. You know, you and I are pharmacists. Uh, pharmacists are not self-promoters in general. Mm-hmm. Most healthcare professionals aren't. Yeah. You know, they're not self-promoters. And that's something that bothers me. And I believe that there is a need for self-promotion. There's a need for every pharmacy association to have the slogan that during the pandemic, we were the only ones standing open. Yeah. And the only one the patients had access to during, in the community, period. End of story. I don't want to hear any excuses. Are you at your computer? Are you on the phone? Are you at home versus traveling? Where's your most power come from? It's talking to people who are giving me the ideas or talking to them when to convince them that this is a new model. You're getting the most done by verbally talking to people. You have to, because I don't think this is something, you can write about it, you can do the social media, you can push it, but you still have to talk and convince, because these are not simple things. These are not two-sentence answers. I've never walked out of the meeting with a policymaker or anybody who is a doubter about the market. If I had half an hour with them and I can just sit down and explain to them how that works, I've never walked out of that meeting for them not to be convinced that it needs change. The problem is everybody wants an elevator speech. That This is not an elevator speech issue. It's too complicated. I love the long podcast format because when the local news comes, they either want a positive comment or a negative comment. You know, you're never right. just like discussing it, you know, and they're just complicated. Exactly. They're complicated things. Well, Robert, boy, good to see you again. Good to see you too. That's fun. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we'll have to set up an annual and we'll get another topic going. Hopefully I'll get some hate mail. (laughs) We can talk about that. (laughs) How's your podcast going, by the way? It's going well. I mean, we we had the best week last week. Great. So it's going well. I mean, it's short. It's 15 minutes. We get into one topic, a policy topic that's patient. We're very patient focused. Some of them are complicated. Some of them are easier to digest, but the one thing I don't like so much about podcasting is that there's not a real great back and forth like right. you would get with social. You know, it's like people listen to it and then like they can go to social and talk to you, but mm-hmm. quite often they don't. But the thing I like about podcasting is that nobody else knows your numbers, which I like. I just like to compete against myself and I don't really want everybody to see how many of this I have. It keeps me doing it for a personal goal and not trying to like, move up a rank kind of thing. Even when you write something, like an opinion editorial and things like that, and I do that too, but podcasting is much more real time, right? Because by the time you write something, it goes through the meat grinder of an editor and everything else. By the time it comes out on the other end, there's probably five other issues. Versus a podcast, you can think of something and you do a podcast on it tomorrow you know, and talk about it more real time. I got to do it real time just so I can remember what I'm thinking about. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Robert. Good to see you. Have a good week. All right. Take, take care. care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.